good morning their teachers, their community, their friends. So let's uh, enjoy the three sounds of the bell and our breathing with uh, the joy and the love we just generate together. Breathing in, I experience joy. Breathing out, I experience love. Breathing with the joy and breathing with love. Good morning, dear Tiger Sangha. Mm. So we're still in our uh, Peace in Oneself, Peace in the World retreat. And welcome to our uh, beginning a new session this morning. And so uh, I'd like to introduce to you my sister, my right, Sister Queen Niem. I got to know Sister Queen Niem 15 years ago uh, as we were aspirants in Plum Village. And uh, I... Um, I'm very happy that she's uh, here. And uh, one thing I've uh, learned from Sister Quinim is that she has a lot of dedication to uh, practice sitting meditation and to study, even outside of the, the daily schedule of the Sangha. And so uh, staying fresh for the, the practice like that, I, I've uh, benefited from Sister Quinim's example. We lived together in uh, Deer Park for many years, almost 10. and. Uh, in organizing tours like this or retreats or outings or newsletter mail outs and stuff i i see city quinium is a sister who's ready to say yes most of the time uh, if she has doesn't have a good reason to say no she say yes <laughs> and uh, can do many things with a lot of kindness and perseverance and also an aspect I've recognized in Sister Quinim living in the same monastery is she gets along with most people most of the time. And that is very rare. So it's a precious uh, quality. And uh, uh, also, um, I appreciate the sense of, of sisterhood she brought with uh, her to Plum Village. There was a group of friends actually ordaining together. So we ordained in the same ordination family, and there's four sisters that knew each other from Florida before ordainings and I also brought a lot of kind of togetherness and a lot of joy and love into our ordination family so I'm, I'm very grateful for that so, uh, Dear, dear respected teacher, dear uh, beloved community, um, I would like to introduce my brother next to me, uh, Brother Fab Ho, which translates to Brother Dharma Protection. Um, we've ordained together uh, in the Wanet family, and we're only uh, 
we were born like only seconds apart, and he's my elder brother. So I'm lucky to be his younger sister. I often take refuge under my brother um, because I feel that he's very uh, uh, solid, very stable. Uh, and at times when I can lean on someone for support, I would often uh, go to my elder brother. Uh, my elder brother is uh, Swedish, but he, uh, in addition to uh, speaking uh, Swedish, he also speaks many other languages, uh, including French, English, and a little bit of Vietnamese. Maybe he understands more than he can speak, and he's a bit shy, but he understands and speaks Vietnamese as well. Uh, my brother enjoys, on his spare time, to go hiking. And we often hike a lot when we were in Deer Park. And he also enjoys playing volleyball. Um, I, my brother did a very good job of applying uh, the beginning of new practice already by watering my flower so much. <laughs> but um, I'm sorry, I'm not as prepared as he is uh, to water his flowers, but, um, but he's very solid and a very wonderful brother to have. Um, yeah, and I, it's uh, wonderful to have him, him in the Sangha. Uh, thank you for being there, brother. So I was asked by my brother to, to share first, even though um, for me it takes a lot of effort to, uh, to sit before an audience. Uh, you can say I'm in, an introvert and I'm quite shy. So coming before an audience, uh, it's, it, it takes a lot for me, but I'm, I will do my best to give my brother support. Um, so today we would like to uh, share with you uh, the practice of beginning anew. I hope that um, all of you had a chance to arrive uh, and to settle in uh, on this fourth day of the retreat here. Mm. Having the opportunity to come here um, the practice is a very compassionate act for yourself because not all of us have that opportunity, especially with the lifestyle that we are taking. We're so busy and to set aside five days just to come on retreat is, is very valuable and very uh, rare and precious. Um, so we can give each other flowers, you know, for making this commitment to come here and practice with the community because I know that it takes a lot to be here. Um, and um, for this retreat, the theme is uh, peace in oneself, peace in the world. Uh, as many of you know that um, it's very important to generate that peace within ourselves. Uh, and by coming here and just allowing ourselves to be in that flow of river, flowing with the Sangha, uh, we are already generating that peace together. Uh, and not only do we ourselves benefit from that peace, but we can also uh, share it with other people. Um, at hand, we can share it with the people around here in this community, and then we can take that peace home to share it with our loved ones. On the first talk by our elder sister, Sister Annabelle, she has touched on the Four Noble Truths, and the first one is suffering. Um, many of you are aware that um, suffering is very widespread, and a lot has to do with how we relate to one another. Um, many retreatants, when they come here, they have expressed that they suffer tremendously because they are not able to communicate with their loved ones. Uh, the husband is not able to talk to the wife. The father is not able to talk to his son. The mother is not able to talk to her daughter or her son. So communication is being blocked off. And as you see, if we're not able to communicate with each other, 
we're not able to understand each other. And so therefore we suffer tremendously. And nowadays, with the rise of modern technology, most of the time we're on our devices, um, either on our laptops, on our iPhones. We're so busy that we don't really have time to be with our loved ones, to be present, to face each other eye to eye and have a conversation. And so that's really um, adding to the suffering that is happening uh, within our own family because we are not able to sit down and talk to each other. We have lost the, cap uh, the capacity to, to talk to each other, mm. to talk in such a way that we are able to understand each other without being irritated, frustrated. We also have lost our capacity to listen to each other to really be present and listen to one another. And so coming here on retreat, it allows us to really come back to ourselves and try to learn those tools again so that we can uh, look at our loved ones you know, in the eye and be able to talk to him or her. Let us enjoy a sound of the bell before I continue. Over the years, uh, living in the community, Pei has stressed over and over again the importance of building sisterhood and brotherhood. And when, after each time Pei mentions this, I often ask myself, why Pei? We are so busy as monastics. We have so much to learn, to learn sutras, to learn chanting, um, we don't have time to really build brotherhood and sisterhood, you know, because we think we can get along with our brothers and sisters. But as I've learned that it's really a key uh, living in the community, and you can also apply this at home uh, with your siblings, uh, with your spouse, with your children. And having that time to really just be present for each other. Like we, in the community here, we often um, play sports with one another. Sometimes the brothers would play with the, uh, the sisters, volleyball or soccer, uh, or sometimes we would go on walks together or just sit around and have tea. Uh, those are some of the ways that we build brotherhood and sisterhood in the community and even though, you know, it's like very petty activities, um, you think you are wasting time, you know, just sitting around drinking tea or playing sports or going on walks with your siblings. But I've noticed that when we take the time to do that, we really mm, have that opportunity to get, to get to know our brothers and sisters. Like my, for myself, I, Whenever I am engaged in volleyball or I drink tea with my siblings, I actually learn a little bit more that I seldom, that I don't really know about my siblings, my sisters and brothers. Because sometimes we would just meet over in meetings. We meet to get things done, uh, to organize retreats, or just to, to have um, the community running, things that we need to get done in the community. And very often, um, it's just mostly discussion to get things done. And we don't really get a chance to really get to know each other. 
So on those activities outside of the schedule, having tea and playing sports, I find that, oh, okay. So my sister has this background that I've never heard about or has this uh, difficulty that I didn't know about. So it's a, a chance for me to really get to know my sisters and brothers a little bit more. And I find that very important because when we do come to meetings, you know, having that background, knowing that background of my sister and brother, it helps me to understand my brother and sister a little bit more, uh, to see where he or she is coming from and the views, you know, that he or she may hold. So it really helps me to understand my siblings more and we get things done. And so I see that even though we might see that these activities of drinking tea or just hanging out is, is very petty, but yet they can be very effective. Uh, when we do come together to get, you know, to meet over important stuff. So I would recommend uh, highly, you know, just to find the time to sit down, you know, with your uh, family members, with your coworkers, with your friends, uh, just to hang out and to get, them a, to get to know them a little bit more. And by under, having that understanding, it will help with the relationship a lot. Living in the community, I also see that, well, there's actually a saying that when one gets married, you know, out in society, one only have one in-law. But when you ordain and you join the monastic sangha, you have not, you don't have one in-law, but you have 100 in-laws. Imagine 100 in-laws. In the Asian culture, you know, when, you, when, uh, the, when someone gets married, you actually live with your, uh, your in-laws. And the mother-in-law can be very, very difficult. Uh, and the, the daughter-in-law has to put up a lot, you know, if she's not well-behaved or she doesn't serve the mother-in-law enough, then she will suffer. So that's why they have that comparison. Uh, you know, coming into the monastic sangha, you will have a hundred in-laws to handle. And I see that that is quite true, you know. It's, uh, it's not so exaggerated because Imagine a community. Uh, we have members uh, from different cultures, from different upbringings, uh, from different life experiences. So when we come together, of course, you know, when we work together, we will have conflicts and they are bound to arise. So that's why we have, living in the community, we have so many uh, opportunities to practice. Uh, practice to say uh, to say something kindly or unkindly, uh, etc. So there are so many moments to practice in the sangha. Mm. But I I see that also at home. You know, a family of five can give us also many opportunities to pr to practice. Uh, it's not always the, the case that we can do things the way we want. And so, you know, sometimes we have to compromise in order for harmony uh, to, to take place and to have happiness. Uh, we have that, to have that sacrifice. So, with the beginning a new practice, it's... Um, they're more or less, it's a practice of uh, reconciliation and renewal. But it, it can also be used as a preventive medicine to strengthen one's relationship. Um, but I see that even though we have these tools, we don't practice enough. So I think, I think many of you have been here on retreat, so are familiar with that. I think it's, it's now time to get down to the practice. If we really want to um, 
connect with our loved ones and still uh, continue to nourish, you know, the love we have for each other because it's still there. The love is still there. That's the truth. But it's just that over time, it's not renewed. That's why the love slowly fades away. So we have to really apply these in a way that we can so that the relationship can be renewed uh, and we can strengthen our relationships. So I would like to uh, just briefly write the four steps of beginning anew on the board for us to know if, uh, for those who are not familiar with them. So the first one is uh, flower watering. So this is uh, quite simple. Uh, it's, it translates to saying thank you. Thank you uh, to the other person or expressing appreciation for the things that they have done that made you happy. Um, so this is a very important practice because Sometimes we don't really recognize uh, the strength and the positive qualities in the other person. Um, or sometimes we see it, but it's not being expressed. So when we practice to water, to acknowledge the other person's strength, it also helps us to recognize the strength within ourselves. So sometimes we need to practice this more often. It could be little things. Uh, for instance, um, the last few days I was uh, quite sick. I was uh, coughing a lot and I couldn't sleep and I felt kind of bad for my roommates because they had to bear with my cough throughout the night. And my sister's uh, roommates, who some of them I've never met before and I had a chance to stay with them. They were kind enough to uh, bring me food uh, share with me different ways to take care of my cough. Uh, so just, uh, I think it's very wonderful um, that uh, we can lean on each other for support uh, when we're not well. So I, I had expressed my appreciation for those small things that they have done for me. So, you know, in your everyday life, when you encounter something and you appreciate what the person is doing for you, you can just let him or her know and to thank him or her. And I think it's very important, even though it could be a very, uh, you would think it's a very unimportant uh, gesture to do, but I think it, in helping to strengthen relationship and getting to know each other, I think it's very important to be able to communicate positively with one another like that. Uh, the second one is expressing our regret. Mm. 
this is uh, this translates to saying, "I am sorry." Perhaps uh, out of your unskillfulness, you have said or done something that have hurt others, and you just want to apologize to them, and to do it in a, such a way that is sincere and from the heart, and not to expect uh, a reciprocal apology in return. Uh, this past year, I had a chance to. Uh, take on the responsibility of being work coordinator at Blue Cliff. And I must say that um, my monastic life has been a smooth ride up until this point. Uh, it's, uh, it's one of those responsibilities where all of the members in the community shies away. Uh, and nobody wants to touch it. And so I thought I was courageous because I had just, you know, moved to Blue Cliff a few months before that. And so I said, okay, let me do it because nobody one else, no one else wants to do it. So I, I took the courage and I said, okay, I'll do it. Um, and I think it was a very precious uh, opportunity for me, even though I struggled a little bit. Uh, there were some challenges that I had to face, but I... It was precious because I, I had the opportunity to really learn more about myself and to see exactly where I'm at in the practice. And I can say that I have a far way to go. Um, so the work itself is not, is not hard. And I, I, f I see that I have uh, the health and also the capacity to take on physical work but I see that the reason why I struggle so much was I see that mm, the fact or the reality of how I relate to my sisters and how my sisters see me. And it was kind of sad to see um, that I need to strengthen um, the area of building more sisterhood. I see that's a shortcoming for me, and I, I, I need to practice that more. Um, and so, it was difficult to accept that on my behalf, but I see that it was quite precious that I had the opportunity to really uh, look into my shortcomings and practice with that. So, even though it was uh, challenging, it was um, quite valuable for me to have that opportunity. Mm. And so, as we were preparing for the U.S. tour, uh, have being uh, Blue Cliff, the first segment, we, worked, we had to work a little bit hard uh, to prepare a monastery for the tour. And um, two weeks before the tour began, we changed our schedule a little bit to make it light and just focus on work to get things done. And at one point, I was feeling a bit stressful because uh, the Sangha was working hard and uh, there was complaints here and there that they were tired. And so I had to put up with that. Um, and in addition, there was like tensions here and there from different members in the community. And so I felt I was, my cup was being full. And one day, I was sitting in front of another sister having breakfast, and she just, um, out of her own room, um, she just said, mm, how's the work going? Just made a very um, short statement like that with a very soft tone. And right in that moment, I responded, it's not done, it has to be done. And so I responded with such a tone that was so harsh and so unkind that she reacted a little bit, but she didn't say anything. She felt, okay, she, she understood what's happening. And so she just kept quiet. And later on, I noticed that as we were crossing path, I find myself trying to avoid her, and I couldn't understand why but I, I noticed that I was holding a lot of tension and irritation, and I was venting it out on my poor sister, whom was, uh, who was quite not involved, you know, in this process, but yet I, 
I had somebody to, I needed someone to just vent it out. You know, this irritation, this tension that I was carrying, so I thought I vented out on her. And so, coming back to my room, I felt, I felt so uncomfortable with myself, you know, for just behaving the way I did. It was kind of weird on my part to actually, you know, did what I did and do what I do, did to my sister. And I felt quite remorseful. Uh, and so I finally made the effort uh, to, to see her. Um, I took the courage and I told her that I was sorry for uh, just being, saying uh, unkindly what I did to her and for my um, inappropriate behavior towards her. And she didn't have to take that, you know. But I felt I was carrying all this and I just had to let it go. And so when I uh, expressed my apology, she accepted right away and she understood because she was one of the few sisters that I was close to uh, there. And so she understood what I was going through and she, uh, and so from there I had the opportunity to just let it all out. So I told her my frustration, my irritation, the stress that I was carrying, and she understood. And so I felt at the end that I was uh, lighter because I had a chance to be heard. Um, and so, you know, in our everyday life, things like this can come up uh, and it can happen uh, unexpectedly. So it's very important that we know how to take care of ourselves and to do what we need to do in order to, um, to repair the relationship. Otherwise, if we just leave it, if I didn't take the opportunity to apologize to her, I think it would cause more damage to our relationship and I would have to carry that hurt and that suffering uh, within myself and I know that it will cause her to suffer as well so I didn't want that to happen in our relationship and so I took the opportunity when I could to just express my apology to her. Um, the next step is um, expressing a hurt. So sometimes things other people can say something or do something that can hurt us. So it's very important that we um, let the other person know. But at the same time, it's very important that we check in with ourselves because it could be a misunderstanding or a misperception uh, that we have uh, in order for that hurt to take place. So when we do suffer, yeah, it's very important that we look deeply to see the source of our suffering and where it comes from. Um, and then the last one uh, of these four steps is sharing a, like a long-term difficulty that you might have and asking for support. Mm. Living in a community sometimes, um, I've seen this most, uh, mostly around health issues when we're not so well. Um, we can just let the community know and to ask for support to be off rotation, etc., or to uh, do lesser work, uh, do in such a way that we are able uh, to do, just with our own capacity. So these are the four steps to uh, beginning anew, and um, I would like to stop here and to allow my brother some time to share, because I know that we don't have a lot of time. Thank you for your listening. So dear teachers, dear community, thank you, sister. Um, for me, when I reflect on, on beginning anew, uh, one aspect I feel so important is to be able to refresh myself, to 
to touch joy and to touch freshness. And so every morning when we have sitting meditation, one of the lines is, today is a new day. I vow to go through it in mindfulness. It gives me a chance to begin anew every day, at least every day. Right? And so I, I think this is an a important uh, foundation for practice. And yesterday our sister was sharing if we really don't have enough time, we really don't have five or ten minutes not to practice each day. I don't think anyone said that they really, really, really don't have that time. But we might be doing other things, so kind of to, to continue to build on our practice and looking into our emotions and feelings, like was also shared so beautifully and clearly about yesterday. For me, that's like a, a foundational part to be able to really have a successful uh, process of this kind of beginning in you. And, uh, one, one way of um, renewing and practicing freshness, we were offered the, the first evening. And Sister Brightness were inviting us to eat with our not normal hand, the hand that's maybe weaker. And how many of us uh, tried that out? Okay, good. Me too. For maybe two, maybe th by the third meal, I already forgot. But I discovered some interesting things. Well, first, my left hand maybe be not as skillful to get up the last uh, grains of oatmeal on my spoon as my right hand. Um, but I also discovered that actually the left hand does a lot of things that is not the main hand, but actually supporting, holding the bowl and doing all kinds of things that, you know, the right hand was uh, not so comfortable and uh, easy doing. So it was kind of couple of things I learned. I also recognized they seem when I was eating, putting food in to my mouth with my left hand, I seemed to chew more on my left side too. I don't know how that happened. And so these are like kind of a small little experiment to see what are our habit energies and what are we just thinking is truth and normal and just what life is. Because we haven't explored these other ways of relating to something. So for me, I feel like it's, it's important to keep in the, the background of, of this practice as well. Uh, I remember hearing... Um, <laughs> I remember hearing about a, an experience with Beginning in You that my mom had years ago. She was managing a, a manager of a lunch restaurant and then this lady that always came for lunch and she would always complain. There was something about the food, there was something about something. There's also always something to complain about. And so all the people working at this lunch restaurant, they were kind of getting, you know, when they saw her, they wanted to, to avoid her and, you know, just uh, not having to interact with her because she always had this complaining and criticizing mentality. And I don't know if my mom just prepared it, or, but one day she just approached the lady as she was coming into the dining hall, and she said, oh, good, hello, how are you today? Oh, what a beautiful dress you're wearing today. Are you okay? Maybe she said, what a beautiful haircut you have. You gone to the, the hairstylist or something? I forget which, which she was. But from that day on, she didn't complain anymore. Just that thing of being recognized, being just met with loving kindness and openness and not like, you know, looking down the way and trying to avoid you, but someone approaching you and saying, hello, welcome, and wow, what beautiful you look today. And so that is also like a, a, a reminder for me that, you know, in the right time, small, small thing and small act can have a, a great benefit and can really change the situation, not just for that day, but it continued. So, um, so how to skillfully apply these different practices of flower watering, expressing regret, expressing hurt, and asking for support? Like with any uh, you know, practice that have number to it and seem to have like, normally we would start with the flower watering if we sit down and want to share, so even if we want to share our hurt, we, we want to start with a flower watering and have several flower waterings and several gratitudes to share before we go into uh, regret and to hurt. Just to show that we're 
we're okay. We're not in the midst of our strong emotion. We're not getting ready to judge and blame and criticize the other person. But we just want to share how we experience something. So in that sense, it kind of uh, it sprinkled the, the ground, water, so it's not the hard and rocky, the ground, when we start digging to plant a, a seed of reconciliation. And um, for me, I feel it can happen so m many times in daily life to just, uh, when someone recognizes um, uh, small things and offer gratitudes, I feel like it, it, it helps a lot. Sometimes is um, we're recognizing when something's going, on, going wrong, something's not good enough, or something is, uh, you know, um, not, yeah, right. And then we let, let each other know or when we're getting annoyed and we just can't deal with it anymore. It's like, you're squeezing the toothpaste in the middle. Can you just squeeze it from the back? Whatever. It's, I don't know what kind of, kind of conflicts you have around your house, but that was one in, in the house I grew up in. <laughs> and, and so to train ourselves to see what is right, what is beautiful, what is there to be grateful for already so that our, our mind doesn't keep operating in a way of trying to find faults and fixing them. But to practicing gratitude and uh, thankfulness through the year, not just the day out of the year. And time many times it remind us too, when we're grateful, we can be happy. And I notice that for myself too, when I can come back and I can be fresh and open and I can have gratitude of brothers and sisters around me, then I feel happy already. And it seems much easier to hold the difficulties and the challenges that also may be present. I seem to be more resilient or patient or enduring in a light way. It doesn't become like a heavy burden, the challenges, but something that can, okay, maybe this will take some time. Um, and so in sharing um, regrets, Sometimes we practice uh, beginning anew with the uh, uh, families and uh, the parents and children. And it was on a couple of occasions the, the parents would start and I have a regret that you didn't get an A in school and you just get a C. I regret this very much. <laughs> That's not the kind of regret that we want to have in this practice. We're regretting our own actions, not someone else's, okay? <laughs> and so... Um, if there's someone that comes to me and shares something when they notice that maybe uh, there's some kind of friction or some kind of tension between us and, and share a regret, somehow it, uh, it is very easy to receive it and to understand them better. And maybe I become lazy with this myself. Uh, and so it's not like, sorry, sorry. You know, you bounce into someone, sorry, sorry. It's not that kind of, you know, a regret approach, but really to, to show the other person that I'm aware of my actions. Like our sister was sharing so beautifully, like, not just action, but what is the energy behind the action? The words seem kind of, you know, maybe neutral, but maybe the energy behind it was, was you know, loaded. And so to recognize that and to just be open with that, I see that it, it helps to build the relationship and trust that we're ready to take responsibility for our actions and our speech. And, um, and that also makes it so much easier to share if something has been hurt and if there's something that, uh, you know, I've been sitting with. Is uh, depending on the situation too, is kind of sharing a hurt. It, we need to be skillful sharing it with the right person at the right time as well. We have many practices regarding loving speech and deep listening that Thai have offered us. And sometimes we just need to sit and listen to someone and just let them hear us out. Not the other person, not the person that have, you know, made us feel to suffer or feel hurt, but someone that we can trust someone that is open, that is fresh, that is loving. So we could just share how we're feeling. Sometimes just embracing our feelings and our emotions ourselves, 
maybe is enough, but sometimes also we need people around us. That's why we encouraging everyone to practice with local communities and build friendships where we can f express what is going on for us and what hurt that is we're experiencing in a way not to vent. So this is not to create allies to oppose someone, but to just share where we're at. And then for the other person to listen, just as we've been training in, in Dharma sharing, to listening without judging or reacting, without giving advice, without agreeing or disagreeing. And just give the other person a chance to be heard, to be accepted as they are in this moment. I think before any kind of a more uh, uh, formal beginning in you, that is a very important step if possible for that person not to be alone but to be able to share with someone they trust. Because to open up for our vulnerability and to share some hurt, it can be really difficult, even with people close to us. That maybe we want to de develop a, a more deep relationship, but how to do it in a way that we can also feel at ease and feel more trust in the process and not worry that they will take advantage of something, right? So I think that kind of trust is built over time too. So sometimes there might be a hurt. We might uh, have to do our own practice to reconcile within and being aware of the emotion and also coming back and seeing what did they really say? What did they really do? We talk about that as the triggering cause and the initial cause is in us already. And so to have a, respect for our own feeling and experience, but also to reflect on how in a similar situation, I've seen someone else not get hurt much. It's okay, they could just let it pass by. So just to see like, what is my perception? Where is my sensitivity in this area? Why does this seem like such a big deal? Is it because the person, I really trusted them and then they treated me in a kind of unfair way or unkind way? Or is it a, a, an underlying sensitivity and vulnerability in me that I can actually do a lot to transform on my own already. And so, not to isolate ourselves and to take it on our own, but I notice living in community is, uh, um, sometimes it's not just the time to, uh, right away to go and ask for a beginning in you, I want to share something but we start recognizing that it might be habit in ourselves and in the other person. And so like how can we over time recognize each other's good and beautiful qualities? How can we over time express regret for the thing that are uh, our shortcoming? And then when time is right to share about some, some hurt that we experienced. And so there's obviously depending on who it is, if it's uh, our partner, or our children, or our colleagues at work, or distant relatives, this process might be shorter or longer. We don't want to dwell with, with suffering for a long time. But at the same time, if we want to share and resolve it, if we just want to get it out of our system, I've seen it doesn't really lead to a deeper sense of trust and mutual understanding. It can seem like then you kind of get it over with, but then you actually trust each other less afterwards because you just like, you haven't really settled in to take care of and showing the other person that you know what is caused, triggered in you. You know about your feeling, you know about your perception, and you're willing to share about that as well, and not just the other person. I think that is uh, something kind of I've learned. I wanted to share uh, a little bit uh, about the five universal mental formations as a, a framework to kind of understand understand some of, of uh, our beginning new practice. So these formations are always kind of operating. One is contact. So we have uh, seeing, hearing, tasting, smelling, 
So there's six consciousnesses, including our mind. So there's something having a contact with our, our eyes, for example. We see someone. Uh, maybe even see, just see someone uh, throwing a rock at the fish. And our anger comes up. We feel that is a terrible thing to do. And so this contact, if it's uh, something that catches our attention, it will lead to a feeling. So in this situation of seeing the child throwing a rock at the fish, it maybe catch our attention right away because we really care about the fish and we think it's important to uh, uh, protect the lives of animals, plants and minerals, right? And so it gives rise to a feeling, maybe anger or feeling like uh, uh, sad for the fish. We might also have a perception. That is a really naughty kid. I need to straighten them out, whatever it might be, right? And so this goes very quick. Not to mention in a, a situation where we're communicating with a, a colleague at work, there might be some, uh, you know, when we have stress, when we feel pressure by performing, this goes even quicker and we don't have as much space to recognize what's going on. We just need to meet our deadline, whatever the, the cost. And so our habit energy kicks in even, even more strongly. So this is also a kind of a, a preparatory work to, to train ourselves to recognize this as it, it gets triggered in us. And so our attention can be appropriate or inappropriate. And Sister Annabelle was sharing a little bit about this. So when we're looking, seeing the, the boy throwing the rock, it seemed like, a, you know, a terrible thing to do, but we can look with kind eyes and un trying to understand this little boy. What, where comes this violence and frustration from? And so my attention of this boy in this moment, if I can cultivate that kind of sense of openness, can be appropriate. So actually contributes to love and understanding. Maybe there's compassion being arisen in me as a, a way of looking differently. And then the, the perception would be, ah, now, I don't really know this boy, he's been coming for years, but I never spent any time with his family or his, uh, himself playing. So maybe I'll, I'll, I'll try to do that, to understand more what, what is going on. So when we become aware of the thing that grabs our attention and that causes us to have feelings, we'll talk about three feelings or four if you want. And what are the perceptions that, that comes about on this? A, a classical example is uh, uh, a rope on the path, and we think it's a snake. And so living at Deer Park, we, we practice with this a lot, especially walking in the dark. Sometimes I walk around the circle garden, and there's an old uh, black top that is cracked all over the place. So sometimes, depending on how the light comes in, and there's a crack in the asphalt, it looks like a snake. And so even I've had enough experience with uh, seeing snakes, so I know mostly when like, my mind is trying to fill in the blanks to make it look like a snake, it's not a snake. If it's a snake, I know it right away, it's a snake. So this is as we're training to stop and to be aware of our feet, of our breath, we come back to our body, so we start recognizing this process more clearly. So we're recognizing also when actually is our fear, our worry, the thing we heard on television that is fueling our perception and not the situation at hand. And then the fifth is volition. So when we understand someone better, naturally love can arise. But I feel also to even engage and think about these beginning new steps and how to find ways of bringing them into our life, we already have to have some love. We already have to have some goodwill, a good intention of wanting to contribute to more harmony, wanting to contribute to a deeper sense of friendship. 
And with that volition, we will take some steps and some more understanding and love can be a fruit of it. So I see here is a, is a very concrete part of our own spiritual path and our own spiritual practice to engage in these and find ways that we can engage in them in our daily lives. And sometimes we can you know, ask to sit down together. A friend just shared the other day that two colleagues of hers they had approached her, they had a big conflict. And so they both trusted her, so they both had come to her for kind of help. And so she had shared with them about these steps and how to practice and how to come and uh, recognize the good things that they appreciate in each other. And so she's sharing with us as they were coming together, the three of them, to sit down and they start watering each other's flowers. After that, and some regret, and they already start crying and they feel, oh, they can release some of that hurt because there's more understanding. And we're seeing I'm not maybe the only one hurting. Maybe I made some mistakes, maybe the other person made some mistakes. We're both suffering. And actually we appreciate and care for each other very deeply. So this is kind of overcoming that hurdle of, of pride or a sense of you know, certainty of our perception. Like for sure this time he really tried to get me. You know? or oh, now it's gone too far, like this happened too many times, so now I, I'm not going to take this anymore. Yeah. So to, to recognize and to uh, you know, respect what is coming up, but also then taking a step back and saying, really, is that really what happened? Or is there more to the situation? And also learning about our own habits of how we react in a certain situation and how we we see ourselves and see the world. One thing I have, um, I've learned in some time being approached and um, having brothers and sisters or friends uh, asking me to help in the beginning a new process is also that there's no one objective reality of what happened. I, I see that's been a lingering kind of like, I want, I want to understand what really happened, like objectively what really happened. <laughs> But there doesn't seem to be such a thing because the way we engage in the situation, it creates the situation. So it's not this objective thing that's outside of either of the people or that day and the situations. So to understand enough of the situation and helping uh, ourselves to see the bigger picture, I, I see is a very important aspect of it. And another thing I've noticed is that we hold very different expectations about each other some people have an idea of what friendship means or what uh, an older sibling means or what a Dharma teacher means and how they have to behave and they might not be shared by everyone and so it's also this where we're having these expectations and labels it's very difficult to come to an understanding it's very difficult to touch each other as human beings not just but you're the dad or you're the boss or you're the mom or whatever but seeing it as a human being and we can as a child as an employee as whether we're seeing like we have the the, the weaker situation or the the power hold we we both have a chance to practice to see each other as human beings and find a way of relating on that more uh, human being level and then i know is a lot of these expectations and you know uh, can can settle down and we can have a chance to really begin anew and um, not expect the other person to change so we can be happy that's a tall order to put in someone even in the relationship right but sometimes we think if just they would act like this then I could be happy 
And it puts a lot of expectation, a lot of pressure on this beginning in you, which might not work out so well. So these are also some of the expectation and assumptions that we carry with us that we need to explore too if we really want to go through this. Um, we wanted to offer everyone a, a chance to also practice some. How does that sound? Is it okay? I'm happy Sister uh, True Val gave us some uh, you know, warm-up experiences uh, for this yesterday. And so we wanted to offer uh, people to come together in threes, so you and two other people. And we'll have maybe about um, four minutes or so each and to share um, flower watering and regret to start with. And we start with ourselves. What are some of the gratitudes of our, our actions, our body, speech, and mind that we have? Maybe we don't recognize them often. Is there any regret we would like to express to ourselves? Yeah. So like the last couple of days, I haven't felt well. And maybe I, I pushed myself a little bit and I felt like I was uh, weak and not strong enough to just be healthy and well and you know, happily engaging in everything through the retreat. And so that could be a, a regret I, I would hold for myself. And so we can share those two and also to bring in uh, a loved one, uh, a person in our life. Maybe they're not here and they won't be in the, the group of the three, but just share some gratitude and some regret to them so that our two friends could just hear it and listen to us expressing our uh, gratitude and our regret to ourselves at first and then one loved one. Yeah? Does that sound uh, reasonable? Does it sound like a, a, yeah, we can tr give it a try? And so maybe we um, will listen to one sound of the bell just to kind of let those uh, things sink in and uh, coming back and can put our hand on our belly and our chest to kind of give ourselves a gentle hug and uh, with our breath I know you are there and I'm very happy And so we'll have a, a small sound of a bell after uh, about four minutes so we can change and we'll have uh, the three people all have a chance to share. So if you can find uh, two friends to, to share with. So thank you everyone for practicing. It seemed like in the beginning of the session and toward the end, uh, we can touch the, the joy and love of uh, being together and also how, uh, how precious it is to, to be able to have a chance to share and to be heard. I think that's what uh, I appreciate in our Dharma sharing practice too, of, of training in that way and creating this space for us just to, to share what is going on. What is in our heart and to be listened to 
and for us to learn together. But also, it seems there's every time there's uh, uh, many more opportunities. There's many more facets and colors and shapes to life, more textures to life than before the sharing. So I also feel it's, it's really this life-giving process that you know we can feel it. And so I hope you find ways of continuing during the retreat and, and going home to use some elements of this practice. And um, in our, our life of, of practitioners outside in the, the big world where maybe most people around you don't practice mindfulness and haven't heard about the beginning in you, we we'll have, have to be skillful to come back to that humanness. And it's not like this new doctrine we learned and we're gonna you know, put to people. So that kind of a skillfulness and just humanness is, is so important for the, the practice and, and you know, things to be able to flow and for us not to create walls and dams around us, but to, to be able to touch each other's hearts uh, within the community and, and in our larger communities. And so sometimes in, in um, order of interbeing gatherings, there's a, a, a line in the 14 training saying, I want to resolve all conflicts, no matter how small. That's kind of a tall order. And so depending on your state of mind, it can become like this nitty gritty and feeling like I have to try really hard. And so for me as myself, it, the, that is the mentality I have inside. I wanting to take it really seriously, but then I'm com creating conflict because I'm not accepting things as they are currently, uh, accepting the way I think or feel about things currently, so I'm creating more conflict. And actually I can resolve a lot of those conflicts just by my way of looking at someone or something. So for hope we um, can bring a sense of skillfulness in our way of relating to conflict and seeing that uh, if one person push and we do Aikido, we don't push back, is there not much conflict anymore. There's just an, you know, an unpleasant situation. And so that we keep it ourselves fresh and mindful and solid and we can uh, avoid a lot of the difficulties in life. So we hope that uh, some uh, of the sharings have been beneficial and thank you so much for helping create this uh, collective energy of transformation and healing this morning.